Good morning. Good to see you all here today. I was thinking this morning about uh, David and Goliath a little bit. Um, Goliath was standing there on the, the one side and David standing there on the other side. And if you were observing the whole thing and had to you know, take bets on who was gonna win, you probably wouldn't have picked David just because it didn't, it didn't look like a good, way, a, good, a good chance for him to win. But kind of like with uh, Elisha when they're standing up on the mountain and he says, you know, open his eyes so he can see all of God's army that's around. Um, if you substitute God for David and then you take the same bets, Goliath doesn't seem to have quite as much chance. And there will be a day where whatever it is that people think will have to come up against that actual and true vision of who God is. And in that moment, in that moment, every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And so this morning, I just want us to take ourselves to that moment. Whatever it is in life that we think is so amazing, stand it next to God. Stand it next to who he is. And let's just praise the Lord this morning for who he is and that he's at work in our lives. You can stand if you want. You can take a minute and just bow your head, whatever you want to do to get yourself into that place with God. Let's lift him up. A one, two, three.
will sing your praises. You guys can have a seat for just a minute while Bob comes up and shares some announcements. There are so many reasons uh, every day that we can uh, just lift God up and bless him. Um, the idea of blessing really is to intend good for somebody. It, there's, a, there's, there's a lot of aspects to that, I'm sure, but it just, either you're blessing or you're cursing, one or the other. You're intending good for, you're intending harm for. And if we lift up God in public places and we make him look good, that blesses him. So right now, this morning, as we get this song started, is there anything that you just want to lift up God for? Just like a three-word thing, like for his goodness, for his provision, those kinds of things. And just go ahead, and if you're not shouting over somebody, that's fine. Just go for it. Just shout it right out there. So let's just give him some praise this morning. Surely you have some things. Go ahead and shout them out. I know it's a... Yeah. His holy name for his goodness. I sing like never before. Oh, my soul, I'll worship your holy name. There's no other name under heaven whereby we must be saved. The sun comes up, it's a new day dawning. It's time to sing your song again Whatever may pass and whatever lies before me Let me be singing when the evening comes Bless the
trust in you. Stand by yourself on this one. Let's change those used and we's to eyes. Let's sing together. I'm pouring out my heart before you. I will trust in you. Perfect Savior, strong defender, I will trust in you. Amen. Blessed be your name in the land that is plentiful, where your streams of abundance flow. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name when I'm found in the desert place, though I walk through the wilderness. Blessed be your name. Every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. And when the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, oh, Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. sun shining down on me when the world's all as it should be blessed be your name blessed be your name on the road marked with suffering so this pain in the offering blessed be your name cause every Sing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. And when the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your name, blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your glory. you pray with me lord we pray that we would bless your name every day that when the good comes when the trouble comes when the blessing comes when the emptiness comes when we walk in places of abundance when we walk in the dark of night when we walk in the place of thirst
place of hunger, when we're scared, when we're confident. Lord, I pray that, pray that we would turn to you and that we would say, blessed be your name, that you're leading us to the promised land. You're leading us to the abundant life. Lord, we just thank you for this morning, for Pastor Dan, for the words that he has this morning, the truth that he'll bring. We pray that you impact our hearts, help us to walk closer with you and to be able to bring people with us. In Jesus' name, amen. We are in John chapter 18 today. You can turn with, your, with me in your Bibles or your cell phones, either one. John chapter 18. So how many of you use cell phones to read, read on? You do, huh? No playing games, okay? Just, just scripture now. Okay. <laughs> All right. It's great to focus on the Lord in our worship. Thank you, worship team, for leading us. There have been several lawyer courtroom type shows on TV over the years. Starting with Perry Mason. I don't know if he was the first or not, but it's still in reruns. You can still watch it. What's your favorite courtroom show? Matlock. Matlock. What? People's Court. People's Court. Judge Wapner, huh? Okay. Judge Judy. There we go. Everybody's favorite, Judge Judy. What? There's some others. Some other ones. What was that? That's Joe Brown, okay. There were some like Boston Legal back a few years ago, uh, L.A. Law, The Practice, one that's been long running is Law and Order, The Good Wife. There's a couple that I've never seen, but they made the top ten list on the Internet anyway. Suits, have you heard of that? Or Better Call Saul. <laughs> Night Court. That's an old one. You remember that one? That was, that was kind of fun. I liked that one. And, uh, and of course, everyone's favorite was already mentioned, Judge Judy, right? Well, to, and I'm sure there are many others as well that, that we've forgotten. But today we're going to look at two ancient courtroom dramas. A, a quick clip from the drama called The Sanhedrin. And then we'll look at a couple episodes this week and next week from another courtroom drama called Pilate. Pilate. Okay? Now, there were actually six trials of Jesus in about six to seven hours, from about 2 a.m. until 8 or 9 a.m. The first three were religious trials before Annas, the high priest emeritus, and Caiaphas, the current high priest, and then the Sanhedrin. We might label them night court because they took place between 2 a.m. and about 5 a.m., Okay? The last three trials were civil trials, before Pilate, and then to Herod, and then back to Pilate again. And we're going to look at those trials before Pilate this week and next. We're in a series called Journey to the Cross and Beyond. We're walking with Jesus uh, through his arrest, his trials, his suffering, his crucifixion, and eventually his resurrection. Easter's coming, it's not very far away. So today we're going to look at the civil trials, part one today, or episode one in the series called Pilate. And we'll look at a quick flashback to the Sanhedrin as well. But as we look at the trials before Pilate, we're going to see a very interesting dialogue between Jesus and Pilate. They're going to talk about the kingdom of God and give us some, Jesus is going to clarify a lot for us on the kingdom of God, even in his discussion with Pilate. And then he's, they're going to talk about truth. Pilate asks the age-old question, what is truth? What is truth? So John chapter 18, we're looking today at verses 28 through 40. We're not going to read it all right now. We'll just kind of read it as we go, okay? So the first thing we're going to see are the accusations against Jesus, verses 28 through 32. Then the Jews led Jesus from Caiaphas to the palace of the Roman governor. By now, it was early morning, and to avoid ceremonial uncleanness, the Jews did not enter the palace. They wanted to be able to eat the Passover. So Pilate came out to them and asked, what charges are you bringing against this man? If he were a criminal, they replied, we would not have handed him over to you. 
Pilate said, well, then take him yourselves and judge him by your own law. But we have no right to execute anyone, the Jews objected. This happened so that the words Jesus had spoken indicating the kind of death he was going to die would be fulfilled. Remember he said as the serpent was lifted in the wilderness, so he would be lifted up as well, referring to the crucifixion. So there's a couple of interesting notes I want you to see to start with in verse 28. The first thing they say is they led Jesus from Caiaphas to the palace of the Roman governor. And then it adds, and by now it was early morning. Okay? You see, Jesus had been interrogated by the high priest, Annas and Caiaphas, and, and so now it's morning. Wait a minute. You mean they interrogated him at night? That's illegal by Jewish law. We talked about that a couple weeks ago. And, but then the Sanhedrin met to formalize the, the formal charges against Jesus sometime after sunrise, just to kind of give it a semblance of legitimacy. Okay? And then there's another interesting phrase. It says, and they refused to enter the palace because it was the home of a, the reason they did so is because it was a home of a Gentile. And if they entered a home of a Gentile, that would make them unclean and they wouldn't be able to eat the Passover. Okay? There's a bit of irony in all of this. I think John is simply pointing out the, the irony and the utter hypocrisy of the Jewish leaders in this whole uh, ordeal that's taking place right now. See, the Jews here are, are actually more concerned about ceremonial rituals and about outward appearances than they are truth and justice at all. They're engaged in illegal proceedings by holding court hearings at night, and yet they bring to Pilate an innocent man while they themselves are breaking their own laws. This is not just the travesty of justice. This is the epitome of hypocrisy on their part. Well, fortunately, Pilate understands the Jewish laws, ceremonial rules, and so he comes out to meet them. He doesn't force them to come inside. He comes out to meet them, and he asks them what their charges were against Jesus. And, and, and uh, so verse 30 records their snarky response to Pilate. If he weren't a criminal... We wouldn't have handed him over to you. Now, a couple things there. First of all, he's not a criminal, and they know perfectly well that Jesus is, isn't a criminal. He hasn't committed any wrongs, any sin at all, and, and they know that. And the other thing is, they, have, they talk to Pilate like they have some kind of regard for him. They have no regard whatsoever for Pilate, a Roman governor at all. So they're just, again, very hypocritical, even in their response to Pilate. Now, let's flash back to a scene from the drama called the Sanhedrin for a moment to understand the accusations that are being brought against Jesus here, okay? So there's really two. There's first a Jewish accusation and conviction, which the accusation of blasphemy. You'd have to turn back to Matthew chapter 26 to find this. Matthew 26, verses 63 through 66. You can turn there if you like and, and read it with me. It says, the high priest said to Jesus, tell us if you are the Christ, Messiah, the Son of God. Yes, it is as you say, Jesus replied, but I say to all of you, in the future you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his clothes and said, he's spoken blasphemy. Why do we need any more witnesses? Look, now you have heard the blasphemy. What do you think? He said to the whole council. He is worthy of death, they answered. Quick, Judgment there. He's worthy of death. And so the Sanhedrin here have basically convicted Jesus on the charge of blasphemy. You see, they had found no incriminating evidence from witnesses. And they really had absolutely no case whatsoever against Jesus. And so the high priest finally just flat out asked Jesus, are you the Messiah? Are you the Son of God? And Jesus responded in the affirmative. Yes. Now I want, you to ask, I want to ask you a question. Who's in charge of those proceedings? <laughs> oh, the high priest thinks he's in charge. Not at all. Jesus is in complete control of everything that is taking place. He had remained silent up to this point, and yet here he finally decides he's going to answer the high priest's direct question. Why? Because the high priest forced him to? No, not at all because he knew that they had nothing to charge him with, 
And, and so he knew that the only, the only way would be to, to help them out a little bit. And so he says yes. And they accuse him of blasphemy. And so this is the only path to the cross. Jesus literally is in control of his own destiny. He was in the Garden of Gethsemane in complete control. He is in the trials in complete control because he is the one who is giving his life. No one can take his life. He's giving his life as a sacrifice for all mankind. Well, the problem is that the Romans didn't care one lick about blasphemy. They don't even believe in God. And so they would never execute a Jew for blaspheming their Jewish God. That just isn't in their laws at all. And so the Sanhedrin had to trump up another charge as they take Jesus to Rome. And so that brings it, or to Pilate. So that brings us to the Roman accusation, which is charging him with treason. You turn to Luke chapter 23 for that chart. Luke 23, verses 1 through 2. It says, the whole assembly, that refers to the Sanhedrin, rose and led him to Pilate. That's interesting. I find that interesting. The entire Sanhedrin is taking him there, not just one or two. The entire Sanhedrin is taking him to Pilate. And they begin to accuse him, saying, we have found this man subverting our nation. He opposes payment of taxes to Caesar and claims to be Christ. The word Christ means Messiah or a king. And so the accusations basically change on the way to Pilate and from blasphemy now to treason. Basically, they say he's a revolutionary. He's subverting our nation. He's a tax dodger. He's undermining Roman taxation. He claims to be a king, a political rival of you, Pilate, of, of Caesar. He, and, and later in, that, in Luke 23, he says he's stirring up people from Galilee to Judea. In other words, he's starting some kind of an anti-Rome movement. None of these charges are even close to the truth. So in verses 31 through 32, Pilate tells the Jews, hey, well, in that case, you take him and you judge him according to your own laws. The Jewish leaders insist, uh, no, you, claiming that they have no right to execute criminals. Now, that's actually true. They didn't have a right to execute criminals. Rome reserved the right of execution for themselves, and they wouldn't allow the Jews to do so, although they generally turned a blind eye to the Jews who stoned people when they stoned people. So they kind of let them slide a little bit, but that didn't fit the narrative here that the Jewish leaders wanted to follow, okay? So the Jewish leaders here basically hate Jesus so much that they wanted him to die the most excruciating, the most humiliating death possible. Crucifixion. And so they just throw all these accusations against him. You know, if I think about it, not much has changed since the time of Jesus, has it? The world still hates Jesus today. And hatred just spews from the mouths of politicians and Hollywood elite and the media and, and educators and even some of our coworkers as well. They just spew hatred toward Christians. They, they throw all kinds of trumped up accusations that are really are, are not true at all of Christians. Like, oh, your Christian value system is so out of balance and so out of date. Christians are just a bunch of, of Bible thumpers. Right-wing fundamentalist ideologues. Christians want to just force their morality on everyone, or, or they're anti-science. They want to ban evolution from uh, teaching evolution in the schools. Is that really anti-science? No, probably not. They're, they're intolerant people. They're bigots. They're racist. They're homophobes. They're, uh, and they're misogynistic. They're, they, they hate women. They want to ban women's rights to choose an abortion. All these accusations just dumped on Christians today. And the church is just full of hypocrites. Let me suggest to you that when people start throwing accusations at you as a Christian or you hear these things uh, on the TV, just keep your eyes on Jesus, okay? Keep your eyes on Jesus. And remember that he faced all of these accusations, all this suffering, all this persecution for us. For you and for me. 
And so we can certainly endure a little bit of persecution ourselves for him, can't we? A little bit of suffering on his behalf. Well, that brings us then to the interrogation of Jesus in verses 33 through 38. Before we read it, let's talk a little bit about Pilate. Who is this guy named Pilate? Uh, That's who this drama is named after, okay? Pilate. (laughs) He's the Roman prefect or governor over the region of Judea. He reigned in Judea or governed in Judea from AD 26 through AD 36, and so pretty much encompassed all the time of Jesus' public ministry. Now, Pilate normally lived on the coast, in Caesarea, on the Mediterranean coast. Um, But he would often come to Jerusalem, especially during festival periods, like the Passover, and so that's why he's here at this time. He would come to keep order and to maintain peace in Jerusalem. A Jewish historian named Josephus writes of Pilate that he is cruel, anti-Semitic, stubborn, and insensitive. Pilate had a lot of strikes against him. Even Rome was upset at Pilate. Tiberius, the Caesar, was upset at Pilate. He had brought Roman legions into Jerusalem, inciting riots. He stole money from the temple treasury to build aqueducts. He slaughtered Galilean pilgrims uh, on their way from Galilee down to Jerusalem. He dedicated golden shields in Jerusalem and inscribed them with Caesar's image which of course enraged the Jews because it would break the Jewish law of prohibiting any graven image. And so Pilate is no friend of Israel. He would have absolutely no problem whatsoever condemning and executing a Jew. But he also wanted Roman justice to prevail, and he has before him an innocent charged with crime. So he's in a very precarious situation here. The Jews already hated him, and so he didn't want to do anything that would incur the wrath of the Jewish leaders. He was on thin ice with Rome because he had stirred up so much trouble in Jerusalem. And so one misstep, and he could be mobbed by Jewish crowds or deposed by Rome. There's a little bit of a tight situation here. And so all of this leads to a very interesting discussion between Jesus and Pilate. Which centers really around two questions. Are you a king? And what is truth? First of all, are you a king? Verses 33 through 37. Pilate then went back into, inside the palace, summoned Jesus, and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Is this your own idea, Jesus asked, or did others talk to you about me? <laughs> Am I a Jew, Pilate replied? It was your people and your chief priests who handed you over to, over to me. What is it you've done? And Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jews, but now my kingdom is from another place. You are a king then, said Pilate. Jesus answered, you are right in saying that I am a king. We'll pick it up there later. First of all, are you a king? See, Pilate already knew the official charge against Jesus. So he simply goes back and he asks Jesus, are you in fact the king of the Jews? In other words, are you plotting an overthrow against the government of Jerusalem, the, the, the Roman government here in Jerusalem? Are, are you a threat to Pilate? Are you a threat to, to, to Rome? What kind of king are you? And so Jesus first responded to Pilate by simply asking, is this your idea or is this another's idea? Are you just listening to the Jewish people? And that's in, in essence what I find here. Again, who's in charge? Jesus is reversing the roles, isn't he? He's interrogating Pilate now, and Pilate's on trial. You know, Jesus is simply saying, uh, are you, so he's saying, are you a puppet of, of these Jewish leaders here? Are you just following them, or, or are you an independent thinker? Can you think for yourself? Do you want to know tr- the, the truth here? Or are you just kind of listening to everybody else? Well, Pilate then responds, what have you done? In other words, these, these Jewish leaders hate you so much. What is it you've done to, to offend them so much? Why do they hate you so much? And Jesus says, yes, I am a king. I am the Messiah. But he says, not the kind of king that you think of. 
when you think of a king. Uh, and in doing so, he basically clarifies for all of us the nature of God's kingdom. He says, I'm not the king like you think of a king, and it, I'm not ruling a kingdom like you think of a kingdom. Okay, So he clarifies for us the, the nature of God's kingdom. Now, Ron Nagata, if you remember back a couple months ago, discussed the kingdom of God in our series on the Lord's Prayer and did a great job there. And so what we're going to talk about today is a little bit of review, if you will, uh, from my perspective. But anyway, so if it sounds a little bit familiar to some of what Ron said, that's why, okay? So the first thing we learn here from Jesus in his response to Pilate is that God's kingdom is not an earthly kingdom, but it's a heavenly kingdom. Jesus says in verse 36, my kingdom is not of this world. See, if Jesus were here to establish an earthly kingdom, Jesus says it himself, then his followers would have fought with swords and daggers to prevent his arrest. That's kind of what Peter did. But none of the others followed suit, and Jesus didn't let them either. Instead, Jesus willingly surrendered. He willingly gave himself up. And so instead of a, an earthly kingdom, Jesus' kingdom is a heavenly kingdom. A kingdom come down from heaven. Now, Jesus had been born 33 years earlier, but he existed long before his physical birth, didn't he? Because he's eternal. And he left his throne in heaven, his kingdom in heaven, his heavenly kingdom, to come down here to earth to bring the kingdom of God to earth. <clears throat> and, a, and, and so... He, this is a truth that is often repeated in John's gospel, clarifying that Jesus is human, yes, but he's also deity. He's also Messiah. And so what Jesus is saying here is to Pilate, from Pilate's perspective, is that Pilate has nothing to fear. Jesus is not a revolutionary seeking to overthrow Rome and, and to establish an earthly kingdom. Not at all. He's a king, yes. And he's king of all heaven and earth, yes but in a very different sense than Pilate is thinking. Which brings us to the second aspect of God's kingdom. God's kingdom is not a physical kingdom, but a spiritual kingdom. Now, there are some Bible teachers who suggest that Jesus actually came, when, when he came to earth, he actually offered a, a physical kingdom to the Jews. And, and when they rejected that physical kingdom, that's when Jesus, he kind of put the kingdom on hold until the millennium. Only then did he actually turn to the Gentiles, and so the church is, is kind of like this big parentheses in God's kingdom program. I don't think that's accurate at all. I believe that the kingdom that Jesus brought has always been a spiritual kingdom, a kingdom from heaven. Yes, there will someday be a physical kingdom when Jesus returns at his second coming to rule on earth, but the present kingdom is a spiritual kingdom. So that begs the question, what does it take to make a kingdom? I want to suggest that there are three things that are needed to make up a kingdom, okay? You got to have a ruler or a king. You need some subjects to rule or to reign, and you need a sphere or a realm of reign, a, a place where you are reigning. We usually think of that as land, territory, okay? For instance, the most familiar kingdom to us today is what we would call the United Kingdom, right? What's the United Kingdom? Who's the king of, our, of the United Kingdom today? King Charles. That's right. Don't say Queen Elizabeth. Okay, King Charles is now king. And who are the subjects? British citizens, any, or, or even more than that, anybody who lives within the sphere of their reign, which is England, Scotland, Wales, and Ireland. You might even throw in Canada, Australia. There's still some ties there, although they are pretty much independent now. But, but all of that is a part of the United Kingdom. So that's the sphere of rule over which King Charles reigns. Okay, Go back to Jesus' day. You have this Roman Empire. The ruler was Caesar. At this time, Tiberius. The subjects were all the Roman citizens, or not just citizens, but any inhabitant of Rome and Greece and all these other places where the Roman Empire spread to. And so the sphere of rule was that whole Roman Empire, all the way from Spain to Italy to Greece to Asia Minor, present-day Turkey, 
the Middle East, circling and coming back, back down, and then circling back across the lower part of the Mediterranean, northern Canada, northern Africa, I should say, northern Africa. So even the, the top of Egypt and Ethiopia, all of that was part of the, of the Roman Empire. So it pretty much encircled the entire Mediterranean Sea. So now, how would we apply that to the kingdom of God? Who's the king? Who's the ruler in God's kingdom? King Jesus. King Jesus. He said it right here. I am a king. Yes, I'm a king. Who are his subjects? His subjects are anyone who places their faith in Jesus. Believers. Followers of Jesus Christ. And where is he ruling? Where is his sphere of reign? Remember, it's a spiritual kingdom. And so his sphere of rule is not physical territory, physical land, but it's the hearts and lives of believers. It's a spiritual kingdom. So Jesus reigns in hearts and lives of Jesus, of his followers. Let me give you three scripture passages that discuss this spiritual aspect of the kingdom. Matthew chapter 6, and Ron referred to all of these as well. Matthew 6, verse 33. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given you as well. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. That combines kind of righteousness and kingdom. So it's a kingdom of righteousness. It's a spiritual kingdom rather than a physical kingdom. And then he says, the physical things will be given to you as well, but you seek first this spiritual kingdom, a kingdom of righteousness. Romans 14, verse 7, makes it very clear. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking. That's physical stuff, okay? But of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Romans 14, 17, did I tell you that reference there? In other words, it's a spiritual kingdom, a kingdom of righteousness and peace and joy. Where's that at? That flows from our hearts. And so when Jesus reigns in our hearts, he produces that righteousness, joy, and peace, and love, and all these other qualities. And then 1 Corinthians 15, verse 50. Paul writes, I declare to you, brothers, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. What's flesh and blood? Physical nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. And so it's not a physical kingdom. It is a, it's not a flesh and blood kingdom. It's a spiritual kingdom consisting of the imperishable, the soul, the hearts of believers. You see, kingdoms of this earth are founded on power and might, military might, intellectual prowess and political cunning and financial abundance, right? The kingdom of heaven is founded on truth and righteousness. It's spiritual, not physical. Now today, there are actually still some Christians who want to usher in a physical kingdom of God through political power and through Christian laws. It'll never work. You can't do that. Because God's kingdom is not a physical kingdom, it's a spiritual kingdom. The only way to change our environment, our, our culture, is to change the hearts and lives of people that live here. Because it's a spiritual kingdom. When you change their hearts and lives, that will change our culture. You can't impose things on people. <laughs> we can find that out pretty easily today, can't we? Just look around. But it's a spiritual kingdom. Jesus is the answer. Jesus ruling, reigning in hearts and lives today. So that's the discussion on the kingdom. I find it interesting that Jesus makes it very clear in a discussion to a Gentile ruler the nature of his kingdom. But that's good truth for us as well. And that begs another question, what is truth? So Jesus goes on in verses 37 and 38. He says, you are right in saying I'm a king. In fact, for this reason I was born, and for this I came into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. What is truth? Pilate asked. What is truth? So Jesus' kingdom is built on truth. He won people to his cause, to his kingdom, not by force, but through conviction, conviction of truth. Pilate's weapon was a sword. 
a physical weapon. Jesus' weapon was a sword also, sword of the spirit, the word, which is truth. He spoke truth because he is the source of truth. All truth flows from Jesus Christ. He is the epitome of truth. And so the point is simply that God's kingdom is based on truth. Ah, truth. What is truth? We ask that a lot today. We hear about that a lot, in, especially if you go to school, you know, in colleges. What is truth? All this philosophical discussion. And truth is very much under attack today. Intellectuals like to talk about relative truth. Belief that truth changes based on circumstances or on one's understandings of of events and things in life. In other words, there are no absolutes. Well, if you have relative truth, then you end up with what's called subjective truth. What's true for you may not be true for me. And we hear that all the time today in our culture, don't we? Oh, well, that might be your truth, but that's not my truth. Don't force your truth on me. I'm sorry, but the very definition of truth cannot mean that it's relative or subjective. It's either true or it's false. There's no in-between. There's no relativity. There's no subjectivity. It's true. It's real or it's true or it's not. Truth is truth. It doesn't depend on circumstances. It doesn't depend on opinions. It doesn't depend on whims of the day. (laughs) I'm sorry. It doesn't. Jesus is himself absolute truth. And God's kingdom is based on truth. To enter God's kingdom, you must do so through a conviction of truth. You must believe, first of all, the truth about God. Who is God? He's a holy God. He's a just God. But he's also a God of grace, a God of mercy and love. You have to believe the truth about sin. That we are all sinners, and we, because of our sin, we all fall short of God's righteousness, God's righteous standards, and the penalty for sin is death. And you have to believe the truth about Jesus Christ. He's the Savior. He's the King. He, he came to earth, and, and he lived a perfect life and died on a cross to pay the penalty for our sin. He died in our place to pay the penalty for our sin. And then you have to believe the truth about salvation. We are saved by God's grace, not by works, not of anything that we can do, but it comes only through faith in Jesus Christ. He is the way. He is the only way because he is the truth. There is no other way except through Jesus Christ. So you have to believe truth. God's kingdom, spiritual kingdom, is based on truth. And so when Pilate asked, what is truth? I think he was probably jeering at Jesus, probably mocking him, but But little did he know, when he asked that question, he is actually staring truth in the face. The author of truth, the epitome of truth, is standing right there before him. And all Pilate had to do, this is his moment of truth. What is he going to do with Jesus? Will he believe him? Or will he reject him? That's the question we all have to answer. But he simply jeers, mocks, how about his truth? That leads us then in this, in Terry, in this uh, drama to the, in, to the rejection of Jesus, ending the chapter, verses 38 through 40. With this, he went out again to the Jews and said, I find no basis for a charge against him. But it is your custom for me to release to you one prisoner at the time of the Passover. Do you want me to release the king of the Jews? They shouted back, no, not him. Give us Barabbas. Now Barabbas had taken part in a rebellion. So Barabbas was a revolutionary. Jesus, eh, not so much, not so much. So Pilate, at least we give him a little credit here. He has the courage to at least face the crowd and announce his initial findings. I find no basis for a charge against this man. Perhaps Pilate is kind of amusing to himself. (laughs) Where's the revolutionary that they say threatens Rome? (laughs) Where's this tax-dodging anti-Roman insurrectionist? I don't see one. Where is this rival to my throne or this rival to, to Rome, to Caesar? And so Pilate tried to release Jesus. 
But the crowd shout, shout back, no, Barabbas, Barabbas, crucify him, crucify him. So the Jewish leaders and the Jewish people essentially reject Jesus Christ. Next week, we'll talk more about Barabbas as we look at part two of this drama called Pilate. And we look at the sufferings of Jesus that he faced as well. But today, what I want us to get is simply this. In this course of discussion between Pilate and Jesus, Jesus has clearly revealed the truth of his kingdom. Yes, Jesus is a king. But he's a very different kind of king, and his kingdom is a very different kind of kingdom. It's a heavenly kingdom rather than an earthly kingdom. And it's a spiritual kingdom rather than a physical kingdom. So that leaves two questions that I want to ask to challenge you with. First of all, are you a member of God's kingdom? Or if you're a member, are you a citizen of heaven? In other words, have you responded to the truth about God, the truth about sin, the truth about Jesus, and the truth about salvation? Have you placed your faith in Jesus Christ as Savior? That's the bottom line. Pilate could have done so, but he rejected Jesus. How about you? As you sit here and you listen to truth, have you accepted that truth or have you rejected it? Are you a member of God's kingdom? I trust and pray that you are. So that begs a second question then. Is Jesus king in your life? Is Jesus reigning in your heart and life today? Is he sitting on the throne of your life? It's a spiritual kingdom right here in our hearts and our souls. So who's in charge? Who's calling the shots in your life? You or King Jesus? Which is it? To be honest with you, I like to think King Jesus is, but a lot of times, you know, I kind of shove him off to the side and say, hey, I want to be in charge here for a while. Are you ever like that? Who's in charge? Who's calling the shots in your life? Is your life characterized by truth and righteousness and peace and joy? Who's reigning in your heart and life today? Let's pray. Lord, thanks for your word and for just even in Jesus' interaction with Pilate, how he clarifies so much for us about the kingdom of God and about truth. And Lord, just thank you. And I just pray here today that each one in this audience, in this congregation, is in fact a member of your kingdom. But Lord, I would also just pray and trust that each one of us is surrendering to your kingship and allowing you to call the shots in our lives. Lord, we want you to have the glory. We want you to be king in our lives and in this church as well. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hear the call of the kingdom. Lift your eyes to the king. Let his song rise within you. in mercy came in Christ to redeem all who trust in his unfailing grace and hear the call of the kingdom to be children of light with the mercy of heaven the humility of Christ walking justly before him loving all that is right that the light
bringing hope to the world filled with passion filled with You are dismissed. Take God's kingdom with you.